Sure, there we go. I can even hear myself now. That's good. Um, the subject is uh, the idea of having certified healthy homes. And so the presentation for the next half an hour will be about how we've gone about setting up to do this. And then we'll spend the last half an hour uh, asking questions. So if you have a question, you know, please jot it down on a piece of paper so you can ask it half an hour from now. Um, the development of the healthy home standard for conventional construction <coughs> began in 2008 when this uh, opportunity uh, cropped up. It was in Sarasota, Florida, and Will Space was involved with an architect and a builder who wanted to build a healthy house and basically market that. And they were looking for a way to have a third party certification that showed, in fact, that it was healthy. And then they would merchandise, market that, or what they say, monetize that, uh, the value of that. And uh, uh, we put together a team with Dan Stey, who uh, is going to be teaching that class tomorrow and Tuesday with me. And uh, Will Spates, there's an S on the end there, and Larry Gust and, and Allison Wilson helped uh, from Australia. And uh, we introduced that, that uh, standard at West Coast Green and was a draft in September of uh, 2009, and uh, we you know, got comments. We saw the need, and the minute you do something, you see need for change when you read it for the third time. Uh, we made uh, changes in 2010 with Will and Dan, and then the third generation came out in the beginning of 2011 and then worked over by, by Dan and Larry. So what is this HHS? for conventional construction. Well, number one, it is for conventional, conventional construction, and therefore, these building biology principles, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and 17, are not met, can't be met, because we do not have high mass walls that hold heat. We do not have walls that uh, are so-called breathable or transmissive walls. It's constrained by the type of construction we have here in North America at the present time. And we uh, thought it was worthwhile to be able to do something to make the things that are being built today, notwithstanding the fact that we would like to build Duracell houses and clay straw houses, notwithstanding the fact that those are good, they're preferred, we're still building these other things and there's a lot to be done to improve their, their health supporting nature. So with that said, the way the standard works, and you'll see that in the detail if you're staying for Monday and Tuesday, there's a pre-qualification checklist which says, well, you've got to uh, satisfy these sorts of criteria about the site and does the house smell when you walk into it before you even go on with the rest of the, of the so-called certification. Uh, there are, there's an IAQ section, there is a EMR section, and there's a water quality section. And I mean they're checklists. This is basically, did, did you do this? Did you do that? Did you do this? Um, but we also felt that that checklist didn't go far enough. If you didn't check the proof of the puddings and the measurements, if you will, and therefore there's a verification testing part of this thing, and it, uh, it involves IAQ parameters, basically total vol organic compounds, formaldehyde levels, radon, uh, relative humidity, CO2, and ventilation. Do you have a ventilation system in the house? And then EMR, uh, electric fields and magnetic fields, high frequency uh, fields, and radioactivity. So that's what's in the standard. Uh, as well as many, many pages of explanation, because nobody, probably nobody who reads this understands what we're trying to do or why we're measuring these parameters or some of the things that you, why we want certain things to happen on a checklist. This is all explained and why it's about 70 pages when you get all done. You just, if you don't, just look at the checklists. All right, so the reasoning behind this, this conventional approach, this is just my, my mea culpa, as I felt like Benedict Arnold sitting here yesterday as we had the uh, discussion about uh, breathing walls and heat mass and how that you didn't really have a decent house unless you had this type of a house. And after my ears cooled off, and I thought to myself, well, if there are some reasons that this was done this way, and I went back up to the room and I put them together, it was good for me. I hope that it'll work for you. So this is the reason behind it. We have a clientele that we're focusing on initially who are VOC and RF sensitive or they're one or the other. 
in order to uh, have that house work for them, there has to be a barrier involved. And you'll see what I talk about later. And this and for the barrier to work for VOCs, it has to be gas tight. If it's gas tight, it's not going to be transmitting water vapor. So therefore, right away, we do not have a wall that meets that type of standard for building biology. And uh, if we want to have a very really good RF barrier, it has to be, in my mind anyway, 100% metal. I mean, like aluminum foil comes to mind as working best and is available, readily available and not all that expensive. And guess what? Water vapor doesn't move through aluminum foil either. So you know, we're, we're two down, and we, so we can't do that. Um, now, well, it would be nice to not do stick construction, just as Orem has said several times, we have affordability issues with, uh, with a stick, without using stick construction. And then on top of all that, we decided that these things had to be built in the factory. I mean, I've heard for the last two days all this commentary about how guys on roofs pull out different caulking and start using it. You can't trust the contractor to do this, that, and the other thing. You have to have somebody watching all the time. Uh, we felt that control drove the need for a factory building process. We can do those sorts of things. We can, because the factory is building many homes, we get truck shipments. We can better control the nature of the truck and what it's been exposed to. And we store the materials inside, not outside, the, not in the weather, the rain, the dust. And then on top of that, we can build inside so we're not subject to, to the environmental hazards of weather and dust. Uh, the employees are typically longer term employees who are there on site who can be trained. You know, we're really concerned about you know, what kind of clothing do they wear. We don't want them wearing their own clothing. We want them wearing uniforms that are washed in our own wash machine with our own products that they wear when they're working on these products. So there was a lot of, a lot of uh, stuff that uh, we wanted to control and we didn't think you could do it at, at really very well at a building site. Factory building requires lightweight materials. If you're going to move this, convent, this home to a building site, then it really can't be aerated concrete, uh, cement filled, uh, Duracell and so forth. And there are also great questions as to whether those things would really move over the road uh, that well and reach the other end and still be in good condition. It's not a proven concept at this point. The people that we're working with, and there's, we've had dozens and dozens, uh, if not hundreds of calls at this point when this information got out, they were on a livable home yesterday. And they do not have the energy to go through the building code problems at their local levels and suggesting some sort of what I would call unconventional house. And that was another check mark as to why we needed to follow this process. We have a, the goal of uh, 10,000 homes in 10 years. And so we also don't think with the economy the way it is that we are going to sell those homes in like just in California. They're going to have to be sold broadly once this again creates an issue with contractors building houses, how would you possibly train contractors all over the country when you could possibly have a manufacturing plant in the east and one in the Midwest and one in the west that you would then build these things and ship them from these plants? What was the genesis of the whole healthy home concept? Uh, this was a uh, an idea conceived of really by, by Doug Bush, who, who was in Malibu, California. He uh, made his name as a well-known well large format photographer. He's even, he's even built large format cameras that were used in the process. He's a, uh, a museum quality photographer. His stuff is in a lot of the art museums. He also is a local designer, builder of what were for many years high-end homes. You know, he's getting older and looking at life and saying, you know, I really think I need to do something more useful with my life than building high-end homes. What's that going to be? And uh, he started something called the Ecotech Design Studio, which was uh, uh, housed in uh, this building here on his property. This is the home that he built and the office is here. It's always nice to go to the office. And. Uh, he got in a bunch of students from UCLA and places that were on their way to graduation, engineers, architects, and developed this think tank. And I was called into it. 
And I began presenting something's in the air and uh, uh, information on that and the body electric information on elect you know, electrobiology. And this stuff all kind of began to percolate. One of Doug's uh, really interesting concepts was this, he's on quite a bit of land and he wanted to develop an eco park where he would demonstrate to, to, to the public and particularly school children how you build soundly ecologically. And uh, that was, this is Malibu, they don't approve anything very easily and there's, you know, there's people around, residential kind of area. And in two years, he, he, he got approval from Malibu to build this sort of eco park and we were offered a, a prime location in the eco park to present what it is building biology says about building homes. Now that's a little bit delayed because the recession and all that is, has uh, you know, caused money problems and so forth. But that, that's where the whole thing began. And then we were talking about what electricity and how that affects people and chemicals and how that affects people. And you know, Doug is thinking about the way he built. I mean, we, we had John over here thinking about the way he built all these years and saying to himself, I don't want to build like that anymore. You know, we think you know, we should be making healthy homes. And one of his other stumbling blocks is he thinks that mu much of the construction today is ugly. The appearance of the homes from outside and they should be they should be beautiful, they should be aesthetically pleasing. And so you can see this began to percolate and develop into this idea of, uh, of uh, building affordable sanctuary for the middle class and making it healthy for people and ecologically sound for the planet, uh, making it affordable. And what we're kind of like when we say affordable, don't write this down and publish it, but around $150 a square foot for dwellings like over 1,200 or 1,500 square, uh, 1500 square feet. And uh, aesthetically pleasing, and the goal was to 10,000 homes in 10 years. So we also found there, that there were seven, the estimate was seven million people with MCS in this country. And uh, there were growing numbers of people with EHS, and we all know that, and I've been involved with doctors and. You know, in California, they're seeing three and four people a week as smart meters go in. They can't sleep. And then there's another contingent of people three or four months later who have problems and it's totting up to be maybe 15% of the population who are being affected by this. And so is there need to build sanctuary for, for a person who can't live what they're living? There's also this MCS, EHS is electrohypersensitivity. There's a crossover, as Dr. Ray mentioned. I didn't realize it was that high. 80% of people who have MCS are EHS on top of that. So we wanted to design homes that would work for these people. Now, we're realistic. We don't think that there's a, there's a continuum of sensitivity from very, very sensitive. You've got to live maybe outside in the open air to less sensitive, and we don't think you can build a house practically with conventional materials even though they're selected in a factory and come up with a house that everybody can live in because we you know we do think that there are you know there's a call for some people that they need basically to be living in a metal box that is they say you know steal everything with maybe baked on you know, melted glass on the walls what do they call that i can't think of it, the enamel on the walls and but there are no factories that build this and if we prove to be successful doing this, we're willing to entertain the idea of doing that <clears throat> just because it's a socially responsible thing to do, but we can't do that without having money coming in from doing uh, the more doable part of this. So we've been, uh, we, we've pretty much been plugged in with the chemical sensitivity, electrosensitivity network since about April of this year, and there's quite a bit of, of excitement. The communications within that community are almost instantaneous. And uh, they've been waiting since we've been uh, gonna, going to do, it, do our thing since April. We've been delayed by a lot of factors and it, uh, it's finally beginning to move. You might ask, you know, why, why build for the, this, this market? Well, we think right now the building market's kind of crowded. We need a reason for being. And if we can, if we can build a pro product that works for the canary in the coal mine, and we can build that product at a price that is affordable to the middle class, and you are aware, then, okay, toxic home, one that the canary can live in. Toxic home, 
canary, which one would you want? And so uh, we thought that we would then kind of position ourselves as the go-to company. If you wanted to have a healthy home, as demonstrated by, and we don't say multiple chemically sensitive people, we don't say chemically sensitive people, because the majority of the population really doesn't know that. They know about people who are sensitive to chemicals, like perfume or something of that nature. So we talk about it in that, that way. So um, meeting the needs of the, this community is, is pretty is hard, which is why you probably can't meet the needs of everybody. Because we have different reactions to the same chemicals. We all know that there are people react at different levels to the same chemicals. Uh, and by and large, even if we gave them a list of the materials that we were putting into this house, they have, would have no idea really whether it was going to be working for them or not. What they needed to do was come to the house and live in it for a while. And so we, we decided the way to go was to build a test unit, put this on a piece of land, and uh, you know, book people in. Uh, right now it's a week stay because it now it looks like the demand is so high to come stay in it that we can't have people stay for any more than a week if we're gonna put many people through this thing. So yes, we decided that we would build a test unit. Here's, a, here's kind of a picture of what it looks like. Um, it's 380 square feet, it's not very large. It could be moved all at once from the factory to the building site. And it's got a, basically has a, you know, a very small living room and a bedroom area, bed and a bath, and a very small kitchen area right over here in the closet. That's it, 380 square feet. If you needed to move out of your house and live in your backyard, this could be brought in, dropped in by a crane, and you could live in it. But you know, how do we assure that uh, that to people, you know, how do we assure to people that we have what we claim we have? And what we really need to do is to have an independent third party certification of the fact that this home is what we claim it is. And that is independent third party ver verification for every home. So uh, what is the standard? There's only one. The healthy home standard for conventional construction is the only standard in the United States or North America that speaks to these issues, not are not influenced by construction industry or the government. This is strictly what we have interpreted the need the need to be. We could be wrong, but we our our, our, our uh, requirements are pretty stringent at this point. And when I say every house, I'm saying that the the cost of the assessment is built into the price of the house. So the people who are being trained tomorrow are the cadre of, of uh, let's say, uh, certified assessors or approved assessors who would then be sent out and they would be paid by the company to make this assessment. In other words, you can't buy the house without paying for the assessment up front. How do we build it? As I mentioned to you, we have to control the building environment. This is very important. We have to select materials to meet the goals of the healthy home standard. We have to uh, design a structure and assembly to meet these goals. We have to build in a highly efficient manner. I mean, most construction sites are just a, just a sea of waste, cut off two by four, you know, eight inches of two by four, goes to landfill. A tremendous amount of waste in uh, on-site stick-built construction. Uh, the factory we were working with is able to minimize waste, and any waste they have left over is, is recycled. It doesn't go to landfill. This is not what happens at a construction site because there's too little of anything to really do something with it at an individual construction site. We wanted to be able to have trained and dependable employees. Hopefully, they were most of them were longer term, and uh, we wanted we were tempering the, tempering this with a realistic view of what could be done. I mean, there are materials limitations. There's only certain materials that you can get. There's only so far you can go. We can't shoot for the moon because we have to make these things affordable. That's one of the objectives that we have for this. And we have tech technology limitations. I mean, these factories that exist today, maybe not, not next year, but today, they have limitations as to what kind of homes that they can build. I mean, they're using dimensional lumber and conventional techniques. Most of them don't even have the ability right now to use steel studs wanted to do that. So 
So factory built modular homes, that was the thing we came up with. And I mean, this, most people, when you hear factory built or modular, the first thing you think of is, uh, oh, that mobile home down the block, you know, double wide to bring it, hook it together. These are not mobile homes. These are homes that meet the building codes in all areas. They are made of the same dimensional lumber. There is no, uh, there is no cutting, cost cutting on materials like there would be in a so-called mobile home. We talked about the protection from weather, and, uh, and then there's a, there's a verification at the factory to the healthy home standard. And we took, uh, we meaning I, took the healthy home standard, and I, I carved out of it a subset of things that you could actually measure at the factory, because you can't do a site evaluation at the factory and other things that could pertain to the home when installed. And these are the things that we want to build to checklist, we want to then verify at the factory that the things we can measure actually uh, are met before we, before we ship this thing out. We were called Ecotech in the, in the previous slide. We changed our name to PH Living, which really stands for Pure, pure Home Living. And uh, the people who are the principals are Doug Bush, his wife, Lori, who's an interior designer. The architect, Michael Francis, of 17 years worth of architectural experience, a pretty good business in, on the East Coast, building nightclubs and restaurants, actually. And uh, a, a man looking for something more um, you know, satisfying to do than build restaurants and nightclubs. And then myself. And I'm, the, I'm the guy who's, who's responsible for the electrical layout, the shielding decisions, the the vetting of every piece of material has gone into this place. So the design of materials. So we want we designed for VOC exclusion. That required a, a VOC barrier. What are we going to do with this barrier? Well, because we can't control all of the things we're putting into the house, we can't get zero VOC materials for most for many things like plywood. For instance, it's still got VOC. We want to put most of that stuff outside of this VOC barrier. The VOC barrier needs to be as close to the interior living area as possible. So that barrier has been, depending on what we're building, if we're building like double wall homes that are, have very low energy, very high energy efficiency, then we put a different place. If we're building a single wall home, which is what this example home is, the test home is a single wall home, then this barrier is going to be going on the face of the two by four prior to putting the drywall on, the finished drywall. And since it's uh, foil, it will serve also as an RF barrier. So we have uh, not only designed for exclusion of that, we've designed a six-sided RF exclusion. And we're very, very careful about, you know, where the, the walls meet, where the roof and the walls meet, where the walls and the floor meet so that we have uh, what, uh, you know, we take care of that issue that uh, we talked about a minute ago about how RF leaks all over the place if there's a, if there's a small gap. We've designed for electric field mitigation, so meaning where this place is all MC cable. There's no Romex or plastic jacketed cable in it. Uh, and we hope that there's no magnetic fields because the wiring personnel have been trained in the three strategic errors that cause high magnetic fields and our errors in wiring. And uh, you know, we've, we've vetted 100% of the materials used, and uh, there is, uh, the materials are like available, shipped into the factory. There's nothing else to use but those. So we're able to control that whole thing a lot better. This is sort of the, you know, one sheet out of many sheets of the materials that we're, we've run through that were vetted. It's not really germane as to what's on there. Um, we learned things that, that I knew and we talked about already this, this uh, yesterday, is that the MSDS sheets are insufficient. You know, not all chemicals are listed. They don't have to be listed. Or there's, you know, they're lower than a certain level. Manufacturers are reluctant to talk about these things until you, uh, until you come through them by way of the purchase department of your, of your home manufacturer. And then all of a sudden, they're very, willing to talk turkey. You get Dow Chemical to release information to you that they wouldn't, to that company they wouldn't release to an independent 
uh, person. So it was, you know, it was really refreshing to be able to talk from the perspective of strength to these people. Uh, we found that Green Guard for Children in Schools, I mean, that's probably our best standard out there today uh, for materials and furnishings, but in fact, the toughest standard, I think that you know, the TVOC levels are still higher than those allowed by our standard. There are less than 500 uh, micrograms per cubic meter. Formaldehyde is still higher than our standard. We, our standard is 100 here, and that would be, uh, that would just be an okay. We're, we're less than, yeah, we're less than 100 for a uh, no concern level. Formaldehyde's uh, you know, a couple, t two times higher than we allow. Our, uh, we'll have that right down here. So this is the HHS standard. This is the building biology standard for these things. There's also the realities of dealing with volatile organic compounds. And when you really stop and think about this, you, you, you see that natural woods have volatiles. We had commentary about hardwoods are better than softwoods, and so you have less volatiles depending on the wood you choose. But you can't construct houses out of hardwood. I mean, you could, but you, you know, you'd have a problem with your with your cost target here. Cheap, but not cheap, but affordable you know, being the cost target. Even even plywood, even though it's now, which is no added urea formaldehyde, everybody is is, is NAUF now or NAF. But there's still volatiles associated with all these products, even though they don't happen to be formaldehyde. You know, sealants have volatiles. Paints and sealers have volatiles. Well, metal doesn't, which is why you know the metal home is possibly a possibility for the extremely sensitive. Ceramics don't. Glass doesn't. I have a couple of asterisks there because I expect that Dr. Ray to still be here, and he uh, says that glass, you know, glass can, can carry pollutants because glass is actually a rather porous surface. So for some people, what's on glass may be an issue that has to be dealt with. Uh, concrete doesn't, but mold release compounds, which are broadly used to be able to take the, 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 the boards that are used as forms off of the concrete, those are awful. They're, they have awful emissions, so you have to be quite careful about that. Uh, you know, mortar, which you might use in tile, doesn't have emissions, but modified mortar, you know, that uh, gives it more flexibility, might. So uh, there's you know, possibilities. You can use all metals and ceramics to build the house, and I, it's just not practical from a technological materials availability, aesthetics, and cost standpoint today. You know, maybe in five years, but it's just not today. We want to get going today. Uh, so the, the possibility is to put most of these materials outside the VOC envelope. That's the, you know, that's the game plan here and carefully select the materials that are used inside and outside, but with, with very particular attention to what we're, what we're gonna put into the inside of the, of the uh, house. Factory verification to the healthy home standards. So there's about $20,000 worth of equipment involved in the factory verification uh, from the, uh, uh, well, I guess in the, in the translation from Mac to PC, that picture has disappeared. There's a, a total VOC meter by Ion Sciences, about $8,000 piece of equipment that measures uh, you know, real-time VOC levels. And there's a you know, formaldehyde test. We've been unsuccessful in finding a real-time thing, so there's a sorbent tube collection lab test. Mold, uh, indoor mold reservoir is unlikely because you're storing in the inside and get rain down when you build it, but we, you know, we want to verify that that, in fact, is the case. Non-viable cassettes now, and then moving to what they call the, the micrometer. How many people have heard of the micrometer? That's an you know, enzyme-based test for mold uh, used by the, the government and government buildings, fairly well vetted, but it's an upfront six or $7,000 cost to, you know, to get the equipment, but you save the cost of the, the cassette and the lab test, and so, we figured about you know 30, 30 modules we you know, collect the money back. So one of these one of these days soon we'll move to micro the micrometer, and then we have, we get up the uh, the unit that Rob is up here right now is a, the three dimensional electric field and magnetic field uh, testing equipment. You know looking for less than three tenths of a volt per meter and less than two tenths of a milligauss communications radiations uh, gigahertz solutions unit here. 
and uh, radioactive materials using a MedCom inspector alert equipment and uh, desiring uh, no more than the 50% increase over outside. These are all, ba all the building biology specs. You'll find them in, in the, the SBM 2003 and 2008. Uh, some of these may be a stretch. I mean, we just built the house and uh, we, you know, we, we we'll see how we placed it. We had Hurricane Irene drop in on us just after this happened, prevented us from doing the testing we needed to do, but while we were there, we were seeing VOCs in the two and three part per million area, which is, you know, getting, you know, we think we were allowing ourselves four parts per million. Uh, keeping in mind that this, the total VOCs uh, with that meter, you have to measure in parts per million because the, the idea of micrograms per cubic meter is dependent upon the molecular weight of the gas involved. And so when you're doing uh, total VOC measurement with that equipment, you can't get the molecular weights. You can only see how many parts there are of these particular things, you know, per million parts of air. So you have to make that translation. And it's a little bit of windage, if you will. This is the factory. Long building, nothing in it this particular time. Things start at the far end <clears throat> where they're putting together the, um, the base of the, uh, the, the floor, basically, with the, with the joists and everything, on a jig. So there's a jig that allows you to be efficient in laying these things out to speed up the amount of, you know, the speed up the amount of uh, uh, time it takes to put together the base of the unit. And there's a similar jig uh, that is being used to construct the ceiling. So these are the ceiling parts you can see uh, Right here, the foil. Can we maybe can we maybe kill some of the, uh, the, the fluorescent lights? Uh, the only way is oh. the engineer has to shut the fluorescent All right. The other room Sorry, I asked. Okay. <laughs> so that you know, so that's the barrier. You can't tell right now, but actually that barrier is is between two layers of drywall. Oh, there we go. That's, that'll help. And uh, the walls and the ceilings are built on the, on the mezzanine. They're basically a second floor. And they're, they're dropped by crane down to the assembly line and assembled uh, to the base. And here we see that happening with one of the walls, one of the other walls. And you can see the, uh, the tail of the, of the aluminum foil material, which is, by the way, what was in the last 10 years, this material was installed in the Pentagon. Every outside wall of the Pentagon contains this material, probably to keep the secrets in as opposed to the RF out, but the same, you know, the, the same effect as far as we're concerned. You know? And there, you can see the fold over here. That fold over exists to assure that we have good overlap, and that's folded up on the wall. Once the film is applied to this wall, it's folded up and taped on that wall. And here is that. Uh, roof section you saw being built earlier, being dropped in on top of it. And then looking at the assembled uh, thing uh, just after it's done. So you can see there's no drywall any place except on the ceiling because that was installed during the assembly of the ceiling uh, upstairs on the mezzanine. A little bit further down the line, this is what this is what the particular unit, our test unit, looks like. It's going to be, this is a, uh, a polypropylene membrane that sheds water but yet allows moisture to move through. And uh, on top of that, we, are, uh, we install what looks like metal, and it is. It's core 10 steel. And uh, it, uh, not that you put core 10 steel on, any, on everybody's house, it's because this is an architectural piece that is suitable for pictures for you know, Dwell magazine and so forth. And so we built it with, you know, with that a publicity angle in mind. What you see up over here, is this is the uh, utility shed the where the washer and dryer is located, the circuit breaker panel is located, the, uh, the water heater, the, the tankless water heater is located, the water filter is in there. In this particular case, the, uh, the uh, accumulator tank for the well system, because we we're on a well in this location, it's located there. This is a picture of, uh, of the, the unit packaged up. One of the things that you have ever, people who've seen 
a modular home moving down the highway and the plastics flapping in the breeze and this. It's, you know, there's holes in it and you wonder, well, what the hell is going to be in there by the time it gets to the building site. So this is a sewn plastic bag, basically, that's made of the, the size of the unit and is slipped over and sealed before the shipment is made, trying to, you know, contain the contamination with the objective of throwing, you know, we're putting four or five pounds of, uh, oh, what the heck's the name of that? That volcanic, white volcanic rock that comes in little, little net bags. Oh, zeolite. Zeolite inside to, to pick up whatever might be migrating in on the way over to the, to the, to the building site. And then, this is pretty exciting, because this is six hours later at the building site uh, across Pennsylvania, here in this is Bucks County, Pennsylvania, near Quaker Town, on a 136-acre site, of which we were uh, a church had kindly donated to us for one dollar a year, a, a building site to put this thing in. And you can see the road is so narrow that it's taken up there by the entire building coming down the road. And uh, it's, it's quite the sight to see to see these guys backing, you know, these things into a building site that has this is a, a stone road that was just put in quite narrow, and uh, then we unbag it, getting ready to put it into place. All of the, uh, all of the core 10 panels are pretty much on here. You can see it still basically looks like metal, clean metal. Uh, keep that in mind as we move along. And we get the crane picking it up uh, from the uh, trailer, and this is the, uh, the site work consisted of uh, putting in cement columns and uh, and supports across those columns that would hold the house. And you know, I don't know if you've noticed it, but this seems like it's pretty high off the ground. It's actually five feet off the ground. And one of Dr. Ray's prescriptions for mold control is the house shall be five feet off the ground with no, with no, no trim or decorative, no, nothing to close that off so that there's, there's UV and air, I guess, underneath the building. So it was a you know, 20 or 30 minute procedure to get this thing over there and people pulling and tugging to get it lined up so it could be dropped onto these uh, support ribs. And uh, there I am loafing on the job after the thing had been, uh, been dropped in place. And then finally, uh, after Irene and a little bit of treatment of, the, of, this, of this metal with uh, vinegar and salt, which, which, which pre-rusted or rapidly rusted, now we have uh, rusted the metal, and core 10, if you don't know about it, is a, is a steel used in much construction now that it rusts, forms a rust layer and stops rusting, unlike regular steel, which continues to rust and then stuff flakes off of it and then more rust happens. So core 10 stops rusting and it looks kind of beautiful in terms of the shades of, uh, of uh, orange that are on it. So this is what the, the thing looks like. There's a deck around the outside and we're missing the stairs. They're actually over here and that's done now. This is a shot from the inside. And we have uh, metal furniture, and although you don't see any pads on it, they're, they're, we're having uh, pads made with uh, organic fabrics and uh, uh, natural latex foam you know, inserts for those. So, certification to the healthy home standard. We talked about that a little bit. There's a final report card, which is bas with bas basically, basically based on letter grades delivered in indoor air quality, electromagnetic radiation, and water quality. Um, there's a checklist for pre-qual and um, all the other things here. And there's a, there's a factory test. Of course, it couldn't be shipped if it, was not, if it hadn't passed in the factory. You have to figure out what went wrong and has to be corrected before it can be shipped. Then after this thing is uh, completed, installed, and like I said, ready to move into, there is uh, the H, the Healthy Home Assessor, who comes in to take a look at the house according to the Healthy Home Standard. And uh, as I say, the, lab, the fees for him or her and the lab fees are part of the purchase price. There is, a not, as, a, as of yet, unex, not existing a Healthy Home Standard panel uh, by, from at the IV level that, that in order to kind of keep this on the up and up, they're going to be 
charged with reviewing the data from the factory, reviewing the data from the assessor that's produced at the site, and basically concurring with that or asking questions that have to be resolved before this can go on. Uh, and finally, the, the report card is really issued by, by the independent assessor, not by IBE. What's available? Well, we, we are planning on producing things from emergency housing as small as 180 square feet through this uh, 380 square foot that we just put in place there, 700, which would be a one bedroom, and 1,000, which would be a two bedroom. Those are kind of the base of the standard models. And our thinking on this is that we would have what we call a fundamental model. That would be the best that we can do with this construction technology and materials in terms of total VOCs. And then people who didn't like, you know, all tile floors, it's 100% uh, ceramic tile floors on the inside. And, uh, and we have a stainless steel kitchen cabinets, counter, stainless steel bathroom. Some people who uh, know they're okay with other things might choose to upgrade to wood cabinets or something of this nature, above, you know, above the fundamental model. But that being said, they have to accept the responsibility of what happens when they add these things. They've stayed in a unit which was a fundamental unit, and if they're okay with that, then they should order that, they would be okay with that, but if they're gonna change it, then you know, there's a you know, certain level of liability here that we have to be careful about assuming. We're also looking for uh, multifamily housing and commercial uh, type things as well. Perhaps even schools, somebody mentioned schools here during the weekend, that would certainly be a, a real thing. And, and basically also disaster housing. So after the fiasco with the, uh, with the um, What's, yeah, with Katrina and whoever what was the department who had those trailers built and what happened. So we think, although this is a, getting in with the government and getting approved is quite a job, we're looking at that. And there's also been some, some interest in South Africa for, for building these sorts of things in South Africa through the government. So there's all of that going on. And, and, and frankly, you know, we also are looking for investors. The, uh, we've, got, we've got $2 million into this process at this point. investors to, to actually ramp up our marketing at this point. So if you want to spread the word, we're happy to entertain uh, calls from people who would like to do this because they have a social conscience. Now, this being said, I go back and, and, and mention to you or emphasize to you that this may be 20% of the market and to make this a success and to be able to really kind of afford to do what we can for people who are electrically and chemically sensitive. We have to sell to a broader market. So there's a large marketing can. There's a large marketing campaign, and we've we've hired some marketing outfit that you know works in the Today Show and blah 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 blah. Who is you know getting building a website, social marketing interface, uh, you know, blogs, and all this sort of thing going on. Which which October one. This it's not launched yet. But like October one which is the date that we'll begin renting this thing to people to stay in. So that's the next step. The hurricane sent us back. We couldn't get power for two weeks because we hadn't, you know, hadn't been hooked up and they weren't gonna hook it up until they had everybody else who lost power you know, repaired. So we, we suffered from that. We got power on the 13th of, of the month. We need now to do final commissioning procedures, which is to say, uh, uh, we have a, we have a, 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 whole, a whole house, uh, uh, what's the word, a heat exchanger that's in there. So we bring in fresh air, we filter it, we put it through carbon, a coconut shell carbon before it comes into the house. We have uh, a need to, you know, to run that, to take care of anything that's residual in there, and then, then we're going to be doing the testing. I am going to be doing the testing that was outlined here, sent it to the lab. And then by that time, the, the first of October should be here. We'll have had a lot of air flow through it. Um, but I mean, it looks fairly promising when we were in there with a total VOC meter, you know, right after it was dropped in place. So we're hoping that you know, the biggest problem was the bathroom. And uh, I'll you know, share a little secret, which you won't tell anybody outside this room. You know, we come in and they're they're putting the tile on the walls in the bathroom, and they're using a mastic. 
Well, why? Well, because we had some communications. We have some communications issues with this manufacturing plant. It, it manifested itself. So we have, you know, we have this issue with the tile. We put in, we put in the, the right kind of grout. And we we sealed the grout with AFM grout sealer, uh, in the, and then we have we have fresh air ventilation in the bathroom. So we're hoping that that will will take care of this. And probably will because out in the living room, the bedroom, we were at two and three parts per million. It was only in the bathroom. And when I stuck the, the nose of the, of the uh, VOC tester in between, with the grout wasn't in, when I stuck that between the tiles, it would go up to 50, 60, 100 parts per billion we're talking about here. So it wasn't still all that high, but it could be significant, you know, situation for our clients, for our initial clients. So what didn't I cover here as I've been talking along? We're, we're, there, there's a little, strangely enough, a lot of local interest in Bucks County from local officials for, about what we're about this thing. You know, we've had the health department guy over to look at what we're doing, and so at this point we're gonna we're gonna have a uh, you know meet and greet for local officials coming up sometime in the next two weeks. Um, we've got uh, about a dozen people. Renting, waiting to rent. We have a MCS clinic a quarter of a mile away known as the um, Woodlands Healing and Research Center run by uh, Dr. William Kroc. We have uh, a, a greeter who is on site to process people and work with them and handle their needs who works for Dr. one of Dr. Ray's physicians. And not Dr. Ray, Dr. Kroc's physicians. We have a, a, a cleaner. I mean, can you imagine trying to control what somebody is doing cleaning when you're in California, 3,000 miles away, we, we have a, the person who cleans the health clinic who knows all about chemically sensitive people because that's all they treat. And she's right on the bandwagon with the, you know, with the cleaning specific standard that I wrote. So that's really great. We're launching the website. We've got some social media. We have several orders waiting, actually, people who would like to order these things already. You know, it's sort of like 1,000 square foot, 2,000 square foot kinds of houses which would be built in pieces and then move to the site. We are interviewing uh, additional companies to build these things in other areas of the, of the country, looking for a good fit mentally. Um, we expect to have extensive publicity in every area that we move these things into, the newspaper, articles, and all that sort of thing. So what does this say? I mean, this says, you know, I firmly believe that should if this is successful, this is going to help to put IBE on the map because our name, because this is, we're the third party assessment <clears throat> and that's a very important part of the whole thing here. And this is what makes us different from anybody else, at least right now. We, 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 from an IBE standpoint, we hope other people want third party assessment, as, uh, you know, assessors to take a look at their homes too. But for the time being, you know, that's us and we're training the group of assessors and hope that uh, this whole thing takes off around the country. About time, I think. That's it. I have a flyer that I put together because people are all, well, what are the materials? What are the materials? Uh, there's, a list of, there's a list of materials uh, in this, on this flyer. And uh, some of you are going to, I'll be with you in a second, Peter. There are a list of materials on this flyer, and you're going to look at that and you're going to say, well, that's not en exact enough. You know, what is it? And uh, I'm, I'm sad to say that we're in a competitive position where we're not going to release that information. Yeah. You, you can, or people can pick them up on the way out. I mean, uh, so we, can, you know, we, we can't release it to that until we kind of solidify our position, or the $2 million we already spent could be in jeopardy, and we, we really can't do that to be fair to the people who put their money into this already. Okay, Peter, your question? Uh, thank you, Larry. That was very, very <laughs> Awesome. This is coming really on, online, finally. Uh, I was not aware that you guys have been working on this for quite some time. Two, e two have, years, yeah. yeah. I just have a few questions. Uh, the subject was the healthy home standard. So am I, is it correct to assume that the healthy home standard applies to any home which wants to be certified and not only to the homes you presented? Correct. Okay. That was written before this ever came up. 
Okay, so those are two independent subjects we're That's basically right. talking about. That is for conventional construction, so that, that health at home standard wouldn't like apply <coughs> to, to Paula's home because components are missing from that that ought to be rated when it came, came to a full biology uh, compliant home. Okay, uh, I have two more. Uh, thank you. Um, th this project here is independent from IBE. That's is right. Is that correct? That's right. So it's a different entity. Um, you mentioned something, you said don't quote me on it, but uh, about $150 per square feet. If I do the calculations, I end up with $47,000. Let's say $50,000. This was obviously a prototype. Um, is this realistic? Uh, how much did it actually cost with setting it all up because of cr well, renting it's, cranes it's and so on? It's not realistic for, for the first off. Okay. And it was, and it was, any it, frankly, it was about two hundred seventy-five thousand okay. dollars installed on site. But I mean, we're you know we're certainly not that the market wouldn't support something like that. It, it, as I say, it's been it's been tricked out for for magazine. Okay. And there were many extra costs associated with so on and so forth. Okay. Thank you. One last question. Um, you mentioned some threshold levels which are which you require to get this building certified. In the biobiology standards, we have some thresholds. That means four different levels. In, in the healthy home standard, do we have a gradient in there, or is it just yes or no? No, we, we uh, I, I'm okay. <clears throat> we have, uh, in the healthy home standard, there's letter grades, and so you get an A if you, uh, you meet the, the no concern level. Mm -hmm. For instance, that would be less than 100 micrograms per cubic meter on total VOCs. Okay, thank okay. you. And, and by the way, obviously since the, the total VOC instrument can't measure micrograms per cubic meter, we are, we are running, we're running TO15s concurrent with the monitoring of the thing with the total VOC so we can get a handle on what's there. Okay. And uh, before somebody asked me this question because they're an expert on, on um, PIDs, which are photoionization detection, which is how how the how these these total VOC things work? There's a, a little technical glitch on that because it it it, it um, depends on the ionization potential of the chemical that you're trying to find. We don't get into detail. All chemicals have ionization potentials, and the PID has a, a source for energizing various chemicals if if they're below a certain ionization. Potential. There are other chemicals that are too high that will not be detected, which is another reason we want to do TO15 because we want to know about the things that might be there that are high, although they're pretty esoteric and I've never seen them too commonly found. And there's also a different chunk of equipment you can put into the detector which allows you to go another step up, <clears throat> but it lasts 30 days and it's, it's $500. So there's a an issue of test equipment costs. We have to keep replacing it. So with that cravat, we have to be sure that we're, you know, we're gonna be, with this. it's kind of a, a three component mix here. Choose the materials, control the environment. Choose the materials, control the environment. Test it in the factory with a TVOC meter so you can get instant feedback. Follow that up with a, um, with a, um, a TO15, which is you collect the sample in a big tank which is under vacuum, and send it to the laboratory, they, they do mass, the GC mass spec on that to really uncover everything that's there. And then test the home again when it's installed and you do another TO15 at that point. Okay. Larry, that was a great, exciting presentation. Thank you. Um, there, it I is actually, exciting. It is exciting. <laughs> yes. 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 So. After, after all, after all the, the setbacks and delays and everything, it's, it's finally something sitting there. Yeah. So I just have, I, I have three questions, but I'll narrow it down to two. The first question is that on the healthy uh, home standard, there was mention of a uh, factory score. So if this healthy home standard applies to any conventional building, uh, what, how does that play into it with regards to if a home was, say, built on site, there was no factory involved? Well, the, 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 this is a healthy home standard called the modular home addendum. So, okay. if, you so it's something if you were to look at that, you would see the healthy home standard for conventional construction, which is totally built on the concept of, of, a, of a site built home. Okay, great. Because we didn't have this. I was involved at the time that started. Yeah. 
And uh, what we did is we took that standard and we just I took all of the things that didn't, couldn't be done in the factory and they're in gray and only the ones that are left we can do there are still in black and that's basically the way that we, we do that. Okay, thank you. And then the second question I have is, you know, with uh, say something like the living building challenge, frequently, well, what is done is that the measurements are taken after a period of time of occupation. Right. So it's performance space. Is there going to be, when is the testing going to take place with these modular homes in the beginning and perhaps at a later date to see how they perform? Well, it had not been planned. The, okay. the, the, the testing was going to be, because the people, uh, at least these initial clients are particularly sensitive, we would be doing that just prior to occupancy. And then after that happens, uh, people move in their, their stuff, their cleaning supplies, themselves. Who knows what's going to be in that house at that, after that period of time? We, you know, we don't think can be responsible for that. And so that's the reason that there's been no, no testing was planned and no testing funds have been set aside in the selling price to do it six months later. Just uh, real quickly, you had mentioned that the pass or fail will come down to the assessor. Is there? Uh, is Say this, that again. I'm sorry. You had mentioned that the pass or fail of the assessment is going to be determined by the person that's going to be doing the assessment. Do you allow for? I mean, is it going to be pretty subjective, or do they have their ability to? No, it's subjective. There, there's all these things. They're either they're either yes or no on the checkoff, and you get you get a point of order, or you don't. And there's a there's a uh, there's a, a test with numbers, and either you pass it or you don't pass it. <clears throat> I mean, and by the way, I mean, there, there, uh, uh, this is something that Peter asked. That I didn't really uh, amplify on, but you know, you you if you couldn't get an A, you might be able to get a B, which is you know, t total t t t t TOVOCs between 100 and 300 is a B. There are no Cs. The next the next level is F. Last question right here, Larry. Yes, Gene. Yes, uh, Larry, you know, I'm so excited that finally we got our own standard except the LEED. Okay, that's the real healthy home standard. And uh, um, it, it's, it's I, I can tell it, it will be very nice that in the, uh, uh, would just say, emergency situation, then we have uh, uh, a healthy a temporary home for, for people to, to move in. Uh, but uh, in the long run, have you considered the, uh, the climate factor? Well, just say if you have larger square footage for people to live in uh, permanently, uh, then you know, one construction uh, type would not fit every uh, climate. Well, way, so, the way yeah. the factory built housing works is you have to meet the local building code. <clears throat> so during the process of all of the details and paperwork, you know, the factory is familiar with the building codes, or if they're not, they have to be ascertained. The building codes reflect the local conditions because that's what they're growing from. So um, all of the, you know, the, the factory we built this in, which we may not be using again, <clears throat> but they, they ship from, from the border in Canada, with Canada all the way to Florida. And they've been doing this for 25 years. And so there's a great familiarity with meeting local conditions. For instance, the vapor barrier would have to be on the outside, not on the inside, if we were like sending this to Atlanta, Georgia, or something like that. Now, that's a little bit out of my bailiwick, but there are people within these companies who have been doing this for a long time. And they, they know those sorts of things. <coughs> So we're, we're at uh, like uh, 3.12. We have three more minutes? We do have a question. Yeah, we're right of time. And certainly, I know there are questions. And the training's going on tomorrow. So I certainly encourage everyone to talk to uh, Larry about that. And Michael's probably going to mention just that. Larry, you had mentioned that um, the fee paid to the IBE trained assessor who will go out and assess the house on site <laughs> is included in the buyer's purchase price so that the payment is, is taken care of. Um, what, if that, uh, what if that assessor has to travel, say fly to the town where the home is built, uh, it, stay in a we, hotel we are We are making an um, assumption as the travel cost and including that. 
So, so all I, of so the I, travel costs, everything portal to portal plus their fees. Is that's good. right. So I mean, it may not be that we're going to lose money on one and make money on the other when it comes to the travel costs. Yeah. Not the assessor, but the Yeah, I mean, we'd, we'd like to you know, essentially come up with zero. We're not trying to make money on this. We're trying to provide a, a service. And by the way, you bring up, I thought you were going to ask an entirely different question. And I thought, gosh, I forgot to mention that. With each module that's built, so that's, you know, that this thing you saw was one module. The entire house was just as one. We call it, in the business, they call it a box. It was one box. We, uh, a larger home, you know, a 1,200 square foot home might be two boxes. IB, you know, IBE is going to be paid a fee for every box manufactured. And that fee covers the cost of the administration of the, um, um, panel that's reviewing these things, and it provides some remuneration to them for doing this. Not all the details on that and the, the amounts you know, have yet to be worked out because we've yet to sell our first place. But uh, the, the intention is to take care of IBE with this. Back in January and February, and we, was, we were delayed, and there was a lot. There's a lot of time in between. There was a there was a talk about a, a website. <clears throat> that would be administered by the IBE, but wouldn't be part of the IBE. And all of these houses would be basically registered. And you would be able to have a, you know, your house would have a serial number, and a buyer could go in, they could look on the website, and that data would be displayed there for that house, you know, and all the findings. And uh, part of this, um, this per module fee was also meant to cover that. So we have to get down to brass tacks on exactly what all that will cost. And we, you know, we, we had some ideas and time is fast and things have changed. We have to revisit that. But you know, that's my intention, my desire to have that happen. Thank you, Larry. Okay. So we're going to wrap up at this point. Thank you very much, Larry, for your presentation. Yeah.